Is this everything that there is, or is there more? The physicist Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington said, The stuff of the world is mind stuff. And now, 50 years later, quantum physics is validating that statement. Our universe exists within our own consciousness. I'm Ron, and welcome to Simplest State, where we explore creativity and the expression of consciousness in the lives of our guests. John Coeg is a longtime friend who's traveled around the world and lived on every continent. His life has brought him a wide range of experiences, and at one time, he found himself on the very edge of life itself. John has been a teacher of transcendental meditation, a Los Angeles TV station manager, a land developer, and a professional writer for the solar power industry. John describes his struggles and his triumphs as he navigates his way through what he describes as the Tower of Babel that we call life. We'll speak with John and learn more about the expression of consciousness in his diverse life experiences and also how that affected him as he, at one time, said goodbye to his family and friends. John Coeg, welcome to Simplest State and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Ron, for inviting me. Now, you're working on a book, uh, a memoir, and I'd very much like to know more about that. But first, let's go back a little bit. You were born in Vancouver, Canada, in quite a large family, a Catholic family. What was it like around the house with such a large family? I believe there were eight children. Friendly chaos. It was... uh... A good family, parents very good people with high values, live their life for their children. But my dad was an insurance salesman, often out at night and always struggling to pay the bills. He sent all of us to private schools, all eight children. And my mother, who came from, he came from a very poor family, came from a very rich Toronto family. Her dad was a mining tycoon and she studied opera and classical piano and painting and oils was overwhelmed trying to run what was basically a small hotel and and a restaurant. So we were raised with very good values, but a lot of stress. As you mentioned, it was a traditional Irish Catholic family. Were you raised in an orthodox fashion as a very observant Catholics, or was it more liberal? Totally the former. All the Coigs dressed up in ties and suits and went to church as a whole family every Sunday. I became an altar boy, which I really liked. You know, all the Latin and incense and bells and kneeling and that sort of thing. So it was, it was taken very seriously in our family. Outside of church, were there Catholic values that, that influenced your life, that you thought about, that you pondered, that were a part of, of your daily life? Yeah, very much so. I think the the takeaway that was beautiful was, you know, respect for elders, not harming other people. You know, all the, the Ten Commandments, that wasn't so much that it was drilled into me, but it was the culture, and it, it felt very normal. It felt very natural. Everything had to have been bought in large quantities all the time. It must have been... As you said, it's like running a hotel or a restaurant all the time. One of the things that came out of it, which affects me to this day, is because it was always sort of an emergency status, nothing was ever really done. There was never laundry already done. There was a pile in the laundry room and you ironed a shirt that morning. And the food was just, everything was behind. Everything was a stress. And because of that, and also because I later on, when I was in grade seven, I, grade eight, I got a morning paper route and I was chronically tired all the time. I stopped learning things properly. I would learn anything, whether it was skiing, I would just get to slightly beyond the snow plowing stage. So I could ski, but it wasn't a joy. I learned to touch type, but I never learned the numbers. It was always just enough to sort of move along. And so I never developed that capacity to honor studies or to honor a hobby or a skill and get it to that point where it's natural and effortless and it's a real joy. There was nobody's 
fault, but it happened. And to this day, I have that, that I tend to just learn things superficially enough to do it and leave it at that. You attribute that to the way things were in the household because it was such a busy household. But I wonder if that isn't really a much more common trait than you may realize. I think we often say that the first 90% of anything is the easiest. It's the last 10% that's the most difficult. And I think it's a very common trait to do exactly what you do. We do it up to a point, but not many people will carry through to really master and perfect any particular skill or any particular pursuit of knowledge. I think it's very common, regardless of upbringing. Yeah, that's kind of you. Well, let me round it out, because up to grade six, my family moved constantly. I went to seven different schools before I cleared grade 12. Always a new bully to beat up and, and the rest of it. And the end of grade six, we moved yet again, and I was in a new school, Vancouver College, a Catholic boys prep school. And I was just a mess. I was almost flunking. I had no friends. At that time, it was one teacher per class. And my teacher was this man named Brother Julian. It was, the teachers were from the Christian Brothers of Ireland, a lay ministry order in the, in the church. This was a very quiet, wise man, very cultured, Dutch, Dutch accent, and And I noticed, it took me years to figure it out, but he just figured out every one of his students, and he figured me out, which was, had nothing going for me. But I did have one thing, and that was that I was good at reading from the reader. So he praised me for that. Oh, Mr. Coy, you have a a fine voice, you know. And then two days later, oh, Mr. Coy, great. The way you said that, you could be an actor. A week later, Mr. Coy, you could be a a lawyer. Well, you could be the prime minister with that voice. Just that little encouragement completely lifted my self-worth from minus zero to sort of, wow, me? And I ended that year third from the top of the class and went into grade eight to the smart kids grade eight class. But during that year, I got, so I loved studying. I liked history was fascinating, mathematics was intriguing, and I looked forward to homework, did the dishes without being told, had an exercise program. And so I was very well organized and very motivated and very purposeful and successful in what I was doing. An incredibly wise teacher, a type of teacher that really we have too few of, I'm afraid. But again, showing the tremendous impact that positive reinforcement can have, as opposed to highlighting one's shortcomings or weaknesses to encourage, to motivate, to inspire, can transform a life. What impact did it have in your life overall, moving out of childhood and going to church each week? How did it affect your behavior, your aspirations after that? Well, it was a very two-sided sword because those wonderful values were infused and respected and and sort of naturally understood. And they came also a lot from my parents because they were such good people. But the other side of the coin was that when I turned six and got into grade one, they told us about hell and that terrified me. It was if you sin and you die, you're cursed, it's fire and it's forever. Got that kid? And then what really corkscrewed me was that I was told that I could commit a mortal sin even by wrong thought, a so-called sacrilegious thought or a dirty thought, whatever the heck that meant to a a six-year-old child. Terrifying. Yeah, and so from that point on, I was always checking my thoughts. Any sort of spontaneous, natural sort of thought or anything like that, I would just grab it by the throat and censor it. Is this a mortal sin? Can I say that? And again, nobody's fault. It's the ignorance of the world. But it was as though it split my mind in two. You know, I never thought about my thoughts. My thoughts and I were one. But now all of a sudden I was watching my thoughts. So it's like I was split in two, which is impossible. So there's a strain, kind of a head pressure, and always afraid of my thoughts or or censoring. Is, is this right? Or And that kind of killed my song spontaneous and then there were other things that happened to me in my life that traumatized me 
that had nothing to do with the church that that added to that and created a habit in me which I have to this day of thinking way, way, way too much. So overall, not a long-term positive effect if you frame it in those terms. No, and it's in a way a comment on, on why belief is a very dangerous thing, whether it's religious or political or, or cultural, because we're, we're believing an idea and then we'll always be trying to conform to that idea and the way we would naturally understand and comprehend and flow into a situation is just, there's, there's gum in the works, spanners. And genius is, is throttled because genius comes from outside the mind. Everyone knows that. What, what do you mean genius comes from outside the mind? Well, like Beethoven and Mozart both said, they, they did not compose these masterpieces. It just came that. to them and they were the secretary Beethoven, or maybe it was Mozart, who said it would come, the complete symphony, all at once, and it would just roar and thunder in my brain until I got home and wrote down the notes. Right, 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 right. So if I'm afraid of what comes from beyond my mind, this beautiful creativity and inspiration that makes great people do great things, whether it's a poem or art or, or changing a nation, they, they don't come from the intellect and the mind. It's, it's a deeper thing than that. That attitude you had towards watching your thoughts was in fact, could have restricted your receptivity to inspiration. No could. No could, did. Yeah, yeah. It's the disease of the time. You know, everybody right. has that. It's why there's so much interest these days in self-development because people realize just as a global family, we're, we're handicapped and it's not necessary. And so my history of how I got the innovations and hang-ups and shortcomings is mine and you'll have yours and someone else, but it comes down to the same thing. We're not living All right. From that period of being an observant altar boy and, and <laughs> trying to be strict on the rights of Catholicism, you went through teenage years, which are of course, always more wild for everyone. Became, uh, you know, into parties and cars and all the rest of it. But from there, you transitioned again. Went to hate Ashbury at the very height of the, the flower child movement. What was that period, the late 60s, like for you? And, and what impact did that movement have on you? Yeah, that's, uh, well, two parts. Transition from altar boy to party boy was a sellout in a sense. I was a lonely, sort of chubby duckling kid, just no friends, no self-confidence and so on. And then in grade nine, I, for the first time, I became part of a sort of wolf pack, this group of myself and two other guys and peripherally around us some more, but we were the center of it. And the leader of our pack was a guy named Brent. And he was everything that I wasn't. He was my alter ego. He was, he, we were, you know, the, the same medium height, but I looked about three years younger. He looked about three years older. He was first string center on the varsity football team in grade 10. You know, he never lost a fist fight. He never lost an argument. He was funny. He was smart. And he read Jack Kerouac and played Bob Dylan and had catcher in the rye attitude. This guy was so opposite from the, the most that I was, you know, I just, I just really admired this guy. And there was another friend also named John, there were the three of us. And they were real sort of moving towards kind of being bohemians. And so that friendship and being belonging, it meant so much to me. At first, I was sort of scared when I hear them swear and talk dirty and that I would wait for the lightning to strike, but you know, it didn't strike. And Pretty soon I was swearing and talking dirty and we were just doing all the same things. And, and within a few months, it was just like kind of a, a distant past had shifted to another world. But it wasn't a particularly brilliant world. It was just a typical American graffiti kind of high school. But Brent, he started us when we were 15 and long distance hitchhiking. 
And then we started hitchhiking to California. We went usually to Los Angeles where we learned to surf and cruise the mansions in Beverly Hills, check out Sunset Strip. But then in 1968, I mean in 1966, in the summer of 66, we met this guy who was in a band in Vancouver and he told us we had to go to San Francisco and check out the scene there. So we did. Instead of going to L.A., we went to San Francisco and went to Haight-Ashbury. And so for a couple of 18-year-old boys who were already very adventurous, you know, our high school buddies, you know, they'd all, everyone, I don't know if you remember, but everyone our age had seen a TV series called Route 66. It was about these two cool, good-looking young guys who just... When Todd so, and Buzz, I remember. That's them. right, Todd and Buzz. And they would go from town, city to city, across the old Route 66 in their spiffy Corvette, having adventures, no plans, just finding the meaning of life. Everybody wanted to be like them, and everybody had read Jack Kerouac's book, On the Road. But we were Jack Kerouac. We were on the road. We learned something from that, which was that we could leave Vancouver with a duffel bag a few clothes and a sleeping bag and two dollars. Just start hitchhiking south. Something would always happen. Someone would feed us, we'd get rides, there'd be a place to crash. So we kind of got this idea that we didn't know the word, but it was like bohemian life. You know, if you just jump out with nothing, life loves you. You know, this is an intrepid guy. So when we found Haight Ashbury, this was a full blown psychedelically driven bohemian culture where everybody had kind of dropped out trying to find the meaning of life they had their own their own dress they had their own music they had their own lifestyle and it was very very appealing uh, for us so we got deeply deeply into it now having gone to hate ashbury and experiencing whatever that had to offer is somewhere in that area, I think, or at that time, that you started looking for answers from meditation and a more purely spiritual element than obviously what the Haight-Ashbury movement could offer. What, what took you to that and, and what were the steps that led you there? Well, I had a number of experiences with psychedelics, you know, very deep insights and to the subconscious and sort of a glorified outer environment where all the colors, everything was just much more beautiful. And it made it really clear, it was kind of the basis of the whole San Francisco movement, that there's quantumly more to life than we realized and that we're living. Now, when you say that there is more to life, mm -hmm. are you able to, to actually isolate and define what that element was? It was expanded. Everything was expanded. I had insights into my subconscious that were so deep, I realized, well, this is what Freud and Jung were talking about, and they never had the experience. This is worth 5,000 psychoanalytic sessions. And then seeing outside, just looking at a leaf, and just somehow being able to, as though penetrate it, see almost the cellular level, the, the, the life, the vibrancy, the creativity, the energy, you know, the sort of totality of life that just is in that one simple little, little object. And sounds like, for example, music would be a hundred times more profound and deep. You would look at somebody. What I realized, for example, just a simple example, was because I was so scattered in my thoughts and bouncing back and forth between trying to impress people and fears and this and that, I realized... I never watch people. I'm always preparing my next statement. And now I was watching people. I was seeing a hundred times more of what they were saying just in their facial expressions and, and, and body language. It was all sort of, sort of open. So it was a great expansion. But after some hours, it was gone, and then I was exactly the same and very disappointed. It was like an enhancement to life. And life picked up, became more vibrant became more real. You had deeper insights into the workings of your own mind and to what you saw in the external environment and the relationship between the two. Dramatically. Dramatically. And then how did that then transform into meditation? 
Uh, well, it was a bumpy journey. We went to the world's first bee-in in Golden Gate Park in January of 1967. That was kind of the high water mark of the whole movement. About 30,000 kids came to the polo grounds in Golden Gate Park and all those famous bands, The Grateful Dead and Jefferson Airplane and Quicksilver Messenger Service, they played and it was a giant party and there was just this feeling like we're a new generation. All this enmity and wars and hate and discord, it's just going to go now. We'll be happy and harmonious. It was very beautiful. But that was the end of the anonymity of the movement. It was a pretty unknown subculture, not very well known before that. It just blasted around the world. And by the summer of 1967, the so-called summer of love, Kate Ashbury had gone from a bohemian population of maybe three, 4,000 to about 100,000 kids mostly lost, 15-year-olds, confused, absolutely no idea what was going on. Hard drugs moved in like a storm. All the motorcycle gangs were selling heroin and speed and coke and what knows. And there were clinics set up for STDs and bad trips. And it kind of turned into the opposite, you know, like a kind of a ghetto. And I sort of plunged along with that, actually, which is a whole other story. And then one day my girlfriend at the time called a meeting of, with me, with all of my, um, my best friends, including Brent and so on. And they just read the riot act to me. You know, you got to clean up your act. You got to do something. So I got a job and I was just kind of treading water, but I didn't want to go straight because I didn't want to join the rat race. And then in the fall, in actually in November of 1967, a friend of ours who was part of our extended group in Kitsilina, which was the Haight-Ashbury of Vancouver, where we mostly lived, walked in the room and with this beatific smile on his face, and he said, Hey guys, looks like it's possible to get to the other side without dope, to become enlightened without dope. And he had heard about Transcendental Meditation. In fact, he had just learned. And it so happened that a few days later, there was going to be a course in Vancouver with a woman from, from Victoria across the water from Vancouver named Eileen Leroyd, who was the, the teacher in our area of Transcendental Meditation. So we all went, my girlfriend, my friends, we all went and we learned. I didn't really understand what she was talking about, but I just saw in her something, I don't know, mother. It turned out we were born and we had the same birthday, I was the 20th, although she was 25 years older than me. And we just bonded. It was like a, a second mother. So I got into it. And six weeks later, several of my friends and I we were completely out of the psychedelic scene and completely immersed in this new world, new friends. And the reason was, with the knowledge that came with Transcendental Meditation, for especially the founder, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, it was like, wow, somebody finally who knows what they're talking about. It's just pure wisdom. What is thinking? What is the intellect? What is being? How it all works? How you can experience your own essential nature and cultivate it over time so that it never leaves you? And so I, I knew this is what I was looking for. And this is what those previews I got from psychedelics were for to give me the real movie. It was great. So in a sense, what you're saying is that to whatever degree they can, those experiences you had with psychedelics at least made you aware of uh, that there was something more to life, but they could not fulfill it. And then you went to learn meditation, and then you then felt, and not to put words in your mouth, but you then felt that this was delivering on what you called the preview of what, of what drugs had, had provided? Yeah, that's the best way to, to put it. And what we found, you know, through Maharishi, who was a teacher, a seer, you could say, of the Vedic tradition of India, was that in India and even other far eastern countries, this tradition of finding yourself, of unfolding your full potential, was their basic culture for thousands of years. All this knowledge of how to live life, of how to transcend life, of how to understand and unfold everything that there is that's possible. Been around for thousands of years, practices and intellectual understanding. 
So we just sort of fell off the diving board into this ocean of wisdom. It was very satisfying. Now this is the concept, the understanding. Well, it's more than a concept. It's a reality for those that know it. This is what is called enlightenment, nirvana to the Buddhist, moksha, liberation. It has it has many names. Now, were you thinking in those terms when you learned TM already, or is that something that grew and developed as you had your practice of meditation? Is that something you were specifically seeking? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Even in the psychedelic days, we talked about the, the ultimate experience. Sometimes it was called the great white light or breaking through to the other side or doing the death trip. There was this understanding, and I wasn't philosophically sophisticated. A lot of people had read philosophy and, and even Indian thought, which I hadn't. But there was this idea that there was an ultimate, that there was a basis to all of this. There was one simple foundational experience which contained and expressed everything else. And so we already got the notion that we weren't looking for an experience, bright lights or even deep insights. We were looking to get to where it all starts. What is life essentially? So in a vague, not nearly what was well formulated as I just said, but in a vague way that was there. And that's why the knowledge that came when I learned TM, Transcendental Meditation, was just so fulfilling because I'd been starving and then suddenly someone walked in with a great Indian feast. And you then became a teacher of Transcendental Meditation and went on to work with the founder of the Transcendental Meditation Organization, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And it's a technique, of course, that is widely recognized as being the most effective for self-development. That must have been a remarkable period. And I wonder if there's anything that you took from that or would like to convey to us regarding that period that you spent with Maharshi. It was 17 years. In, in 1970, I went to Maharishi's ashram in India, in Rishikesh, in the foothills of the Himalayas on the Ganges River. So it was very traditional training and that that in itself was like a whole podcast the experiences it was like a trip back to the old testament you know there was one phone that occasionally worked you had to cross the river in a boat drive for hours to get to the boat so it was very remote very traditional and then i came back to canada and i taught tm for several years and then in 1974 i just had this this longing to work directly with maharishi and by that time, the TM movement was growing very, very fast. And so we had an international staff of maybe 150, 200 people based in Europe. And I just, you know, it was mostly young people like I was. And so I just, I just had this desire that I wanted to be on his international staff. So I decided it was hard to track Marshy down and didn't really know where he would be. There was no headquarters at that time. So I decided, okay, I'm going to burn all my bridges. I was going to go to Europe. I'll find Maharishi and ask him if I can join him. And if he accepted me, I can just stay. So I remembered my Bohemian past. I sold or gave away every single possession I had, my car, my bicycle, my music tapes, everything. And everything that I owned was in two suitcases, which I left Canada with. And it took me a couple of weeks, but I did find Maharshi and... I asked him if I could join his staff, and he gave what's basically a kind of job interview, many questions. He knew who I was from courses and so on, and from Eileen, my teacher, who was the national leader of Canada. But he accepted me, and I stayed. I just literally didn't move, stayed in the same hotel, and I was with Maharishi for the next 17 years. And what do you feel you gained? from that experience? It was another world. It's really difficult to do it justice. There was a world in which time stopped. There was no time around Maharshi. It was a world in which only the highest ideals that could ever be were what we were thinking about. It was a world where Maharshi was always thinking of the whole world, 
there were always maps of the world and the wall and the globe and people phoning in from all over the world, this TM center in Manila, the Philippines, this one in, in, in India, something coming from Rio de Janeiro. The international staff of 150, 200 people spoke probably 25 different languages. And very soon, I, I stopped being a, a citizen of Canada from the province of British Columbia. It was like I was a citizen of the world from the, from the province of Canada. I just got so used to thinking the world is my family. I was traveling everywhere. I went to, during that 17 years, went to over 100 different countries, saw all the richness of different cultures, how similar they are, an inch da deep down, and how very wonderfully unique and special they are on the surface in dress and manners and, and language and race. But the main thing was being with somebody who, I have to say, he was, this is an enlightened human being. It, it was like being with some ancient sage. How would you define enlightenment in this case? Well, enlightenment is defined as having unfolded one's full potential, which needs a little bit of explanation. Normally we live in three main states of consciousness, right? Waking, dreaming, sleeping, and they're very distinct levels of consciousness. Even their brainwave activity is different. When people learn to meditate, what they learn to do is experience thinking on finer and finer and finer levels until they get to the most abstract, quietest level of thinking and then just leave thought behind, transcend thinking. So the thinker is left by themselves without any thought, but still awake inside. So consciousness, pure consciousness, without being conscious of anything, awareness without being aware of anything. We separated consciousness from what it's conscious of, separated the screen from what's projected on it. Over time, that gets more and more established so that at a certain point, which would be enlightenment, but not the pinnacle, that pure consciousness is never overshadowed by what we're conscious of. We're always overshadowed by what we're thinking, feeling, or seeing, and our sense of self is lost. That is never lost anymore, and it's called cosmic consciousness. And that's awakening, that's enlightenment. The liberation from the limitations of the mind, when they talk of enlightenment as being a state of liberation, that's what you're referring to there, that it's a, exactly. a liberation yeah. from the restrictions of the individual mind, of the ego. Right, I'm no longer identified with, it's not that I stopped being John, but I'm no longer identified, it's like a, as though the, the drop of water is now fully in touch with the ocean that it really is, it remaining the drop of water. But that can be further cultivated or cultured to what they call celestial or God consciousness, where not only is that detachment always there, but on the sensory level, the physiology is so refined, and a lot of this is through devotion, culturing the heart, that everything that is perceived is, it's almost as though you're seeing the molecular level of it, not seeing molecules, but it's that alive, it's that vibrant, everything is beautiful. And then a certain point is reached where there's no longer a separation between consciousness and what we're conscious of. It's all consciousness. And they call that unity consciousness. And it was very clear that Maharshi was in that state and everything that he said, even if he was commenting on what to buy for, for the kitchen, it was just so full of insight and wisdom and humor and kindness. It is just... These words don't even come close to how much fun it was to be around Maharshi. It was like a light bulb. And when I came back to Canada in 1991, and that period of my life was over, it was like I felt like a fighter pilot who'd been shot out of the sky and I was now pulling a milk cart. I'm glad that you said that because I did want to ask, I mean, you said you are there working with Maharshi Mahesh Yogi for 17 years. Then you found yourself back in Canada engaged in business activities. So it's really a transition from the sublime to the mundane, if not the ridiculous. How and why did, did that come about? And, and is that something that you sought after 
And having found yourself in that position, what was the experience that you had? Yeah, a sensitive personal question. The best way to answer it is the way I sized it up after I'd been back in Canada. I went back to Vancouver where I was born and raised. After I'd been back for maybe three, four years, what I realized was that there were certain just basic desires, digging for gold and playing indoor sports, let's call it, that I could not resist wanting to fulfill. The life with Maharshi was, in a way, it was ashram life. And Maharshi is a very traditional Indian monk. If you were around Maharshi, working closely with him, it was kind of understood that you were either married, which was great, you had your spouse, or if not, if you were single, you were celibate, as he was. He was what's called a Baal Brahmachari, a lifetime celibate. Thinking about it years later, I realized I just, like Siddhartha, I just had to go back. Maybe I didn't have to, but I did. I basically knew what I was doing. I wanted to go back into the maze and have those experiences, and, and I did. What did you feel going through that? Was it fulfilling? Was it disappointing? Was it neither? Was it just normal life as usual? But now, at least with the background of knowledge and understanding <laughs> that you had gained. Never really fulfilling. I wasn't good at business and I wasn't good at relationships, you know. It was not a great period of my life, but I had a lot of adventures and I don't in any way regret it. And if all you learn from things like that is that you didn't need to do it, in a way, it's more complex than that. You, you did need to do it. And now I know. That period was in Vancouver. And then the one thing that I had left after that was a 25% interest in a little small boutique company on Vancouver Island that made components for musical instruments out of British Columbia wood. We made guitar tops from Sitka spruce and electric guitar bodies from maple. We had about 15 employees and we would ship 10,000 tops to Yamaha guitar and so on. That was it. That was all that I had. So I started working with them and my job was to go in the forest with this young assistant and look out for the right kind of maple trees. If you, you play a guitar, so you know what a flame maple electric guitar body. We were looking for those flame maple trees, which are one in... 200. So for the next year, I was wandering through the forest with this young boy who was studying philosophy. We were talking about Plato and Aristotle and what I'd learned from Maharshi and these green trees and, you know, the BC forest, a great rainforest. That kind of healed me in a way. And it got over the wounds. And then I moved to Salt Spring Island, where I still live in uh, 2005. And a lot of people come to these islands to recreate themselves. And I decided I'm going to just completely recreate myself. So I joined a writer's group. And we were all writing a book. I was writing a slightly fictionalized memoir of my years in Haight-Ashbury. And then actually at that time, then I found out that I had a chronic fatal disease, which is sort of another story. But it was more than traumatic. You came to a point where you were actually had said goodbye to your family and they had gathered at your bedside to say goodbye to you. And yet you came back from that experience rather miraculously. And very, very, very few people have ever had that experience. And there's a natural fear, of course, of death and what it brings. And no one has been that close to it and returned. And I'm sure that if you were willing to share a bit of that experience, it might be something that, that helps people gain a better understanding of what that experience could be or would be. Sure. Well, it's, it's a long story, but I won't go into the beginning. But as I said, well, after I moved to Salt Spring Island, I found out that I had basically a severely decompensated liver caused by probably a lifetime of chronic hepatitis C that I wasn't even aware of, which is typical. And that um, I was on the last of four stages and halfway through it of chronic, just complete liver failure. And I was told I had probably about five years to live. 
There was a very tough medication regime that I took, which was the only thing available at that time. It was a kind of semi-chemo, absolutely ghastly, for 11 months. I was poisoning myself and um, it didn't work. So I had to sort of ride it out and after about three years, I deteriorated so much that the only hope for me was going to be to have a, a liver transplant. And any organ transplant is quite difficult to get. There are always more recipients than donors. And so it's a kind of catch-22 Russian roulette. You have to get sick enough so that you now move to the head of the queue. You're now the sickest person when a donor organ comes up, but you're not so sick that you're not going to survive this 10-hour surgery. So I rode that wave right to the end. And then finally I, I went to the hospital. By then I was down to 90 pounds. And my brain was mush. Because when your liver fails, ammonia builds up and you're just very confused and foggy. And um, I was admitted to the Lionsgate Hospital in North Vancouver. And um, they diagnosed me as maybe having two or three days to live. And so the doctor told me that I was off the transplant list. There's a lovely doctor. She was crying when she was telling me, but she said, John, I, I have to tell you this so you can prepare yourself, talk to your family, but you have maybe two, three days left. And that was it. I was going to die. I can imagine hearing those words. What went through your mind when you hear words like that? This is it. I knew it was going to happen any time, a little early, but this is it. I, I just went through it. I'm, my mind's going to shut down. My feelings are going to shut down. And whatever's left of me after this body stops, that's going to be it. And uh, it was very deep not scary. What I didn't know was that I was off the transplant list. I still had this, you know, I might make it, I might make it. Because a, a, an organ transplant can happen when you're on the list. It may never happen. It may happen after 10 months of waiting. It may happen in the first five minutes, but when it does, it'll be right out of the blue and you've got four or five hours to get to the hospital and, and have the transplant. So I was always waiting for that call to come. You have a beeper, you have a cell phone 24-7. You're just waiting for the call, waiting for the call. And now the call wasn't going to come. That was the difference. That didn't lead you into despair. You, it was like, okay, I always knew this could have happened. You accepted that or did the yeah. floor not just drop out from under you? Both I, I, simultaneously. Everybody should be told they're going to die unequivocally, unequivocally, and just know there was no doubt in my mind that, in fact, my, my youngest sister, Margaret, called from Bellingham where she was living with her family to see how I was in, in the hospital. And I said, Margaret, yeah, you know, please come up. I, I, I might not wake up tomorrow morning because could you come and just spend the night here? And, you know, so she came whistling up and spent the night there and and I wanted her to keep me awake as long as she could. We were talking and we made a video. I said goodbye to all my friends. And I didn't want to go to sleep because I was afraid I wouldn't wake up. Five in the morning, I finally just fell asleep. And then when I woke up, there was my sister and I was still, I was still there. And then they found out that I was totally dehydrated. And they thought my kidneys had shut down which meant, you know, that, that was added on to it, I was out. But when they hydrated me, my kidneys started functioning again. And so I was graduated from the two to three day program to the two to three week program. So they sent me to palliative care in a rural hospital, Abbotsford, where my mom lives, so she could be close by. And I knew I was off the list. I knew it was just a little extra time. But during that time, most of my old friends came to say goodbye to me, and they knew when they saw me, they'd never see me again. And to tell you the truth, I was very blissful. One thing I knew, 
I don't know what happens. There's the reincarnation school. There's the lights go out and that's it school. There's the St. Peter, you know, with his spreadsheet school. Who knows? But one thing I knew was that life doesn't stop when I die. New York doesn't go out when a light bulb goes out. I just felt connected to life. That was an experiential element or that was an intellectual thought? A knowledge, we could say, an intrinsic knowledge that life goes on or, or was it more just your intellect telling you that life goes on? Well, all my upbringing was life goes on. There was the Christian upbringing of eternal life in heaven or wherever. There's the Asian theory of reincarnation and, and so on. So, you know, I digested all of that. In my own intuition and just from my own experiences, I felt the reincarnation idea made more sense. But I wasn't really analyzing it, but I just expected to come back with new hardware and get on with it. And I thought, you know, it's, I had a great run. Gosh, who else has gone through what I've gone through? And I'm just so grateful. And, and if, if I come back, then I'll come back and I'll have all that momentum from all that knowledge and all that experience. And um, I'll become enlightened in my next lifetime. So I was very blissful. People who came to see me were said I was just kind of uh, glowing. So it wasn't, wasn't a feeling of despair or loss or, or tragedy. It was a feeling of it's time to move on. Yeah. About to go on the next journey and feeling good about it. Feeling uh, actually quite, quite blissful. I was kind of holding court. I was joining all enjoying people coming and... So there was no fear of death at that point? No, no, there wasn't. That's tremendous. I, did, I was afraid of suffering, but in my case, I didn't have to take painkillers or anything. There was no pain. I wasn't comfortable, and I couldn't even move in my bed without help. But I, I wasn't in pain, so I wasn't being drugged, which was a great boon. So here you are today. What happened? <laughs> it was pretty cool. About a week into this, two of my younger brothers, Michael and Paul, were visiting me. And while they were visiting, my cell phone rang and I answered it. And it was Tara, Tara Smith, Nurse Tara Smith, who was the coordinator for the transplant clinic at Vancouver General Hospital, where I would get a transplant, where I was on the waiting list. But I knew I was off the waiting list. So as soon as she said, oh, John, it's Tara calling, I immediately knew that she was calling to tell me I was off the list. And so to save her the discomfort of having to say such a grave thing, I was just about to shoot off my mouth and say, no, Tara, I understand, it's, it's fair. The, if there's a donor organ, it should go to somebody who's not going to die in, in the surgery, that's completely okay. I, and not a word came out of my mouth. It was so a cork got shoved in my mouth. And so she just talked. And she said, yeah, I was calling to get the phone number of that, that boy, Mark. On that man, Mark, he said he was your caregiver. Caregiver, we like to get all the phone numbers we can for you guys. And I said, like, why does she want my, his phone number? So I gave her the phone number. And, um, and she had mentioned during the conversation that, that morning, the, we call them the transplant gods, this group of doctors who decide who gets the transplant and who doesn't. They had met at their weekly meeting, and my case had been discussed, and and she was about to hang up. And I said, well, when she was going to hang up, I said, well, Tara, um, what did the doctor say this morning when my case came up? And I said, oh, nothing. They just wanted to see the results of a kidney test, but it was fine. Anyway, lovely talking to you, John. And I hung up. And my brothers were saying, what's happening? What's happening? And I said, I'm not off the transplant list. They don't even know I'm in the hospital. And so then we got into this huge argument because Michael, my next youngest brother, he was saying, you know, John, tell them where you are. Get into the hospital, get on life support, because that's very common when people are waiting for a transplant. And then you're right there if an organ comes up. But then I was thinking, but if I go in there and then they'll do all kinds of tests, they'll know what the doctor who told me I was going to die knows. You couldn't survive an operation. And I just decided to not say anything. And then I really went downhill. The next two days I almost died. And they were lifting me into a wheelchair. 
to take me to this sort of end of the road palliative care place. I was in palliative care at the hospital, this dedicated palliative care sort of hospice, basically to die. And as I was being put into the wheelchair, Tara phoned my sister, who wasn't there, my oldest sister Mary, to say, where's John? You know, I said, what do you mean, where's John? He's in the hospital. You know, what's he doing in the hospital? Well, he's dying, Tara. And she said, but well, what are you talking about? We have, we have a donor organ for him. Where is he? So she phoned the hospital, got the doctor, who said, you know, I, I like this man very much. He's a lovely person, but I have to tell you, I, as a doctor, as a colleague, I, I don't know that he could survive the operation. So Tara put him on hold, went to the head surgeon who founded the, the transplant clinic at VGH, this larger-than-life surgeon who just said, eh, send him in, we make our own decisions, get him in here. So the hospital, uh, or the ambulance changed its route, roared me in this one-hour trip, and then they looked at me, like, I weighed 87 pounds, I was black and blue because you bruise very easily, you have liver failure, and I was incoherent. And, but it was all so quick, and they just, they went outside and huddled. I heard this after. You know, so what are we going to do? And they couldn't decide, take the chance, not take the chance, because they'd waste a donor organ if I died. And then finally, this wonderful Japanese-Canadian doctor, Dr. Yoshida, Eric Yoshida, who had been kind of, I think, more than anyone, he helped me get on the list in the first place. He looked at the others and he said, you know what? He's here, we're here, the liver's here, everybody deserves a chance. Why don't we go for it? And then the head surgeon said, yeah, we've seen worse. So they went for it. And I almost died during the surgery the next morning. My heart stopped for six minutes. But after that, it was like perfect. It only lasted six hours, new liver. And six months later, I'd gained 40 pounds and no one would have ever known the difference. Here you are. How many years after the transplant? Ten and a half, eleven and a half years. Has that broadened your awareness? Does it give you a new vision of life? Or do things just eventually go back to the way they were? You're still you. <laughs> and things still just... Because that tends to happen with a lot of these dramatic experiences. People say it changed their life, but... Very quickly, it goes back to life as normal. It, same experience we hear from lottery winners, right? Most of them will, will lose their money again after a, a, <laughs> a period of time. Do you feel it changed you in a profound way, in a lasting way, or do you feel that you are who you were before? Uh, profoundly in, in both ways. You put it very well. That there is a tendency, you know, when, when the trauma is over, to get lax about sorting out why that trauma was there in the first place. But it did change me immeasurably. And uh, well, one way it definitely changed me is I knew that I wouldn't be afraid of death. That's continued till this day. Yeah. Okay. Not, not that I, I'm looking forward to it or anything, but I know that I could face it. I also, there were phases in both the recovery and before where I was in the most, the most excruciating pain, I think, imaginable to human beings. And pain that sometimes, I remember in this one hospital where I would just faint. And afterwards, I was kind of happy I'd been able to go through that because I was able to go through it. And I knew I could go through the worst kind of pain again. But as you said, over time, all the old habits do creep in. But my overriding gratitude afterwards, you know, was my surgeon, this wonderful, very, very highly qualified surgeon, Dr. Stephen Chung, who actually did the operation and did the transplant. After um, my fifth day in ICU, after the operation, when I finally was sober enough to sort of know who I was and where I was and sort of know there had been something going on with my liver. And he came to visit and he said, you just got a 30-year extension to your train ticket, John. And I thought, that is very meaningful. What am I going to do with it? So I decided, I won't belabor this just one, one minute, but I decided that what I wanted to do with that 
whatever the extension is, not so much what I want to be or what I want to do, but what I want to do is overcome the shortcomings that I didn't overcome before. And I have many. You know, we just discuss things about never getting stuff done and not learning things properly and and um, little addictions that we have, you know, to coffee or sugar or surfing the net or anything like that. So that's been my project. And over the last few years, it's borne a lot of fruit. I did, after 10 years of trying, stop drinking anything with caffeine, stopped eating almost sugar and all, all of these things that were really hard for me to overcome. I just didn't want to be pushed around by desires and fears. And that's still my project to this day. You know, we often hear of these near-death experiences of the light and yeah. other beings and messages. That wasn't a part of your experience in this case. Well, the reverse was. I would say I had what's called a near-hell experience. And it was probably during the six minutes when my heart stopped, because when my heart stopped, they did what's called a code red. All through the hospital, lights are blinking and there's beeping. And then all the surgeons come rushing into the, that are available, come rushing into the, the surgery theater to see if they could help. And the anesthesiologist who's prepared for this they have what's called a crash cart beside them with various medications they can inject and the fibrillators, the electric shocks. And so I was being fibrillated. And, you know, so that must have been like incredible um, trauma for what was going on in my mind and body. But what happened was I was so gone. It was as though me, this individual called John, was something miles and miles out in the sky, a tiny little point like a kite. And all that was connecting me was this tiny string. But I was connected, but it was a long way away and getting further. And I just, I had this sense, it was, it was, it was more than horrible, the whole feeling. I felt like I was being crushed underwater, like scuba divers get the bends. But I just had this, this feeling, just, hey, let it go. Just let it go. Just stop this game of pretending you're this guy, John Coy. Just let it go. And somehow I didn't, or probably couldn't. And then this feeling of being crushed was so unbearable. I can't begin to describe it. I would never wish it on, on anybody. And then more crushed. It was like, you know those palm leaves and they weave them together so that the four, they're sort of four squares and they get tighter and tighter and tighter as you weave the, the leaves together. That was what it felt like, that all I was was four squares and they were getting tighter and tighter and tighter. It was so awful and I realized I will never have a body again, I will never taste again, I will never touch, smell, I will never drink water again. It was just, it'll just be for eternity, this horrible crushing and it keeps getting worse and worse. And I'm never going to get used to it because it'll always get worse. And then it broke. And it just broke. And then gradually, 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 it, it just sort of subsided. I, when I was coming out of that delirium or that ICU psychosis after a few days, I, I started to realize what had happened. And when somebody donates an organ to you, that's a huge, enormous, amazing thing. And the surgeon on about the, the same day when he was saying, you just got a 20 year extension to your train, 30 year extension to your train ticket, John. He said, I'm not a man of words and I don't know exactly how to put this. So I'll just say it in the simplest way. But I felt when I inserted that organ into your body, I just felt like its owner had said to me, Tell John that I'm in love with my new home and I've settled down into lifelong cuddle mode. And he said, and it was a perfect trans transplant, what we call the conversation. Blood flows, electrical signals flow, happened almost instantly. And it was just, you know, picture perfect. And that night or the next night when I was just lying there in my bed, all of a sudden, I mean, this may sound mystical, but it happened. And I'll tell you why I feel it was true. I, I had this full experience of my donor. 
I couldn't see a face, but I could almost see a face. I knew the gender, I knew the age, I knew the ethnicity, and I knew the disposition. And I knew I got an angel. And I just, I was trying to thank you, thank you, thank you. And all this soul was just saying, I give myself to you. And then it was gone. So it was a very precious thing, and who knows whether it was true or not, or it was just the drugs or hallucination. These things are anecdotal. So the next night, my mother and my oldest sister came to visit me. And my mother said, oh, John, we had the most amazing experience. Last night, these friends, this couple, came and visited Mary and me. And it turns out they're best friends with one of the lead doctors in the transplant clinic. So they started to tell this doctor about their friend, Jeanette's son, John. And then the doctor said, oh yeah, John Coig, oh yeah, he got a good one. And then he went on to describe to them, which is really not supposed to do, went on to describe in detail who the donor was. Had the age right to the year, had the gender, had the ethnicity, everything. I had it right. It was very wow. cool. Wow. There is a lot of controversy about organ transplants and, and being an organ donor. So would it be fair to say that based on what you've just relayed to us, that you are someone who's in favor of organ donors? I've had several people, you know, as we're getting older, we have friends who, for one organ or another, are looking for a transplant, ask me that because they felt divided. And always I say, it's, it's beautiful, it's a blessing. And it's what I would want to do if I were, if I were going out. The, the donor that gave my life back also restored lungs to another person, kidneys, and restored eyesight to three people. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I know you are working on a book, as I understand it, a, a memoir that you're planning to bring out three volumes, which together will comprise an autobiography. And well done, it's just a fascinating experience from, from growing up in that large family in Vancouver through adolescence and becoming a part of the psychedelic generation in Haight-Ashbury onto transcendental meditation and becoming a teacher of meditation and someone who's pursuing the higher knowledge of enlightenment then to business and then this illness and so close to death. Can you tell us a little bit, very briefly, can you give us a glimpse into the, the, what we might expect to find in this memoir, in this first volume? Um, thanks. It's actually been written. The first book will be my life up till I was 23. So up until the time I became a TM teacher. So going through those altar boy, party boy, flower child, learning to meditate phase. The second book will be the 17 years that I spent with Maharshi. And then the third book will be the rest of my life, including my medical adventure. And the overall title for the whole thing is called Satsang Junkie, The Adventures of a Baby Boomer. And this first part is called Bohemian You. Satsang refers to what? Satsang Junkie? Satsang is a Sanskrit word. It means the company of the wise. Seek the company of the enlightened. And if there isn't someone enlightened around, seek the company of other seekers. And it also commonly means a gathering of seekers to hear some wisdom, either from a person or a book. John Coig, this has been a fascinating discussion, a wonderful recount of an absolutely fascinating life. Thank you so much for being on Simplest State. Thanks for inviting me, Ron. That was a real trip through time. I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you. Very much so. Very much so. Mm -hmm.